Good morning, officially. <laughs> the glow Marcy uh, may have seen may have come from a few tears. I just have felt teary all morning and um, Mary, your prayer was massively beautiful, as was the anthem. Thank you three for that. May we see as God sees, be thou my vision. <clears throat> In her book, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I Have Loved, <laughs> Kate Bowler writes, I used to think that grief was about looking backward. Old men saddled with regrets or young ones pondering should-haves. I see now that it is about eyes squinting through tears into an unbearable future. The world cannot be remade by the sheer force of love. A brutal world demands capitulation to what seems impossible separation, brokenness, an end without an ending. It's an in-between world, an in-between life we've been offered, we humans and the other beings with whom we dwell on this planet. I have friends who live in the now, they tell me. That's just fine, I think. But the now was instantly, it became the then. <laughs> and then it's going to be the not yet. <sighs> we live in that in-between place. And when we say now, we're already entered into the what's next. Now in this mishmash of words I've just spoken, there is a core truth that would have been so helpful had I learned it 70 years or so ago. It's subtle, it's so subtle that so often we think of it as, <laughs> well, we seldom think of it at all, I believe. That's how subtle it is. <clears throat> the mysteries of the universe that Hubble and other telescopes show us hush our certainty of the here and now and speak in whispers. This is what it once looked like, and still does, and mystery speaks in whispers of that. This is what it began to look like, and still does, speaks another soft whisper. We see the, the tales of comets. We see the things of other, I mean, Hubble images just are amazing of what is and what will be and what was. <clears throat> this is what it began to look like and still does. Speaks a soft whisper because it's in an in-between place. I use the universe to show the now and not yet. <clears throat> I'm not at all sure how quickly the universe expands or changes from one manifestation into another. <clears throat> but I know it does. I wait to learn of the one thing that is absolutely put in place in the beginning of time and offered no hope at all that it will ever go from that now in which it was placed into a not yet, which would make it 
much more uncomfortable and therefore able to become more of what it was meant to be, who we were meant to be. Apparently, there is no such absolute, for we know with astonishment, even after we've learned it when we were young, or <laughs> that even the stones are living, that the mountains are living. There is nothing. No absolute, stable, unchanging. Now, you may have thought of God as that one unchangeable object or being or, for convenience sake, thing. Immortal, invisible, God only was. But I hope that is not God's nature. Oh, I hope that is not God's nature. Um, pondering the phrase, the unceasing brutality of changelessness leads me to reimagine, to have to reimagine God in a way that I will call in between. When faith shifts into certainty and God is a goal, just as heaven is a goal and hell is a threat, then if one should find themselves in an in-between place, faith-wise, they find that kind of certainty to feel like the craziest of all possibilities. How could one be so certain? And so they start to question. <clears throat> now, it seems so obvious that those who question and those who ponder will be demoted and deemed to be the enemy. Where there is a final answer, an absolute answer set in stone, the quest for understanding and for all that aligns itself with understanding disappears. When there is a final absolute answer, <clears throat> there is a need to destroy what conflicts with that answer. And justice, mercy, and love are sacrificed. For example, unjust laws are passed. And books are banned and even burned to prove the threat of challenge to the correct. And state legislatures declare that police cannot be charged with crimes. I'm not sure if I'm saying that completely right, but uh, that they cannot be, police violence will not be investigated as much as some would like for it to be, <clears throat> and so forth. Books are banned and even burned to prove the threat of challenge to the correct. The right answer has been taken care of. And God in the sky loves the certain and the certainty. Back in the 20th century, if you can remember <laughs> that far back, no, you can't. <laughs> uh, Paul Tillich. A uh, theologian named uh, or defined or described God as the ground of all being. I, I never did quite get that. And John Miller, my theology teacher, who tried to explain it, that uh, Judith called, uh, defined or described God as being itself, being the John John <laughs> said the isness of the world, the, the whole tissue, the ligaments, the, 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 everything that joins us together is God. Well, now, I liked that a lot, but uh, it, uh, 
it, it, there's a, there are others. And, and as you can see, I am progressing between now and not yet. God in the sky, God is ground of all being, God is isness. It's a story of in-betweens for me until I get to this one that, that right now is the one that makes sense to me. And it's uh, from Marcus Borg, who uh, was a biblical scholar and uh, teacher, theologian, brilliant man. And he says... God is the river in which we all float above the abyss. God is the river on which we all float above the abyss. Rivers flow. That is their nature. Life flows. That is its nature. And if this is so which I believe it is. We are always between the now and the not yet. It's not a comfortable place to be if, if we find ourselves among others who may have moved more quickly than we to a new place or, God forbid, may have moved to a new place that there is no way, no way in hell that we'll be willing to go. All those progressives and liberals and the rest of us heathens. But I'm sorry, I speak for one side of the story were Franklin Graham here, he would have a different story. And that's part of the now and not yet. It's that it's that constant rubbing against one another that if we're open to, <laughs> this sounds rather weird, if we're open to rubbing against one another, we will, we will learn from one another, change the, the, the stuff, the, the, uh, the, the stuff will fall off, our, our scales will fall off. Maybe we'll have new eyes. Living alone has its advantages. <clears throat> there are times when the hermit or the recluse or the weird old woman on the corner whose house you don't dare go trick-or-treating to has its charm. <laughs> no one will bother you. <laughs> I grew up in the certainty of absolutes that my dear mother and she was my dear mother, closed Martha and me in to keep us safe. Had she known the damage, she would never have done it, tried not to do it. But in our lives, growing up lives, there were no not yet, no in-betweens. There were only absolutes. There were the absolutes that kept others out. And us, Martha and me, and my dear mother, not even knowing that the world was any different than how we perceived it to be, how we experienced it to be. <laughs> Reflecting on it, it was like living alone because we didn't have to think about any, anybody else. The thinking was done for us. The thinking was done for us. I was 40 or 50 or 60 or 78 before understanding that what I had learned in the cocoon of fear is that what living is, the, the growing into understanding is also a now and not yet. And there are aha moments all along the way. <clears throat> Rather than floating on the river above the abyss, abyss, 
living in that cocoon of absolutes. Don't don't play with Carolyn. That they, they're Methodist. <laughs> Is a rather I don't know. Mama might have said that, although she became a Methodist. Uh, um, <clears throat> Rather than floating on the river above the abyss, what that life is, is getting stuck in the mud and the silt and not being able to go anywhere at all. If you've gone tubing on a low water river and your bottom lands on the mud in the middle, it's just, you just don't go anywhere. Perhaps my need for change, which is certainly evident to those who know me well, is a response to such control in my childhood and young adulthood. <clears throat> I know now there is no safe place. I know that safety, like danger and grief and fear, is an in-between place. The poet, Dancing Faith, has a lovely and poignant way of expressing this. <clears throat> he writes, we are always anxious for Easter, for its resolution and its victory. And yet this is not an Easter world. This is a world stuck on Good Friday mired in the bleak emptiness of Saturday when love appeared dead, caught in the great silence, the great absence. We sometimes forget that it was love on that cross. There is no avoiding the flow of the river in which we all float. When we try to control the flow to make it serve our needs and wants, the river finds its way around our obstinacy. And it continues on its way toward the ocean. We can only choose to adore but never to avoid its journey, which includes the white water rapids of our broken world, as well as those of our broken relationships and our griefs and our sadnesses. Our disappointments blind us and we can't see what's next. Our disappointments blind us deafen us, freeze us, and we can't even know there is a what's next sometimes. Yet, I need windows. The leaves are greening the trees and the forsythia, my oh Lord, that bright yellow and the, the red buds are embarrassingly uh, so gorgeous with that rich color. They would walk down the street, you know, with that flaunting, that gorgeous color. Everything my nature is telling us right now is that there is a what's next. There is a not yet. Look, look. Mary Oliver, a favorite poet of mine and many of yours, <clears throat> has an answer to the brokenness of our world or an answer to how we can move from the brokenness of now into the almost impossibility of the glorious what might be next. She invites us to the river above the abyss and floating to find our way, our own way, to be in such a broken world and to refuse to be broken. 
She writes, I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? <laughs> was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it. And I am, well, <laughs> hopeless. Is my eyesight fading or am I just imagining it? Lockjaw? Dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing and gave it up and took my old body and went out into the morning and sang.